There's a saying, history is written by victors and the vanquished are doomed to read it. The Mau Mau is a lawless and savage uh, organization. We are not concerned of roving people. Prime Minister, the Honourable Jemma Kenyatta. But what we want to get is power. Tomorrow. We want to rule our country. And so, on Monday the 27th of January 1964, Taifa Leo, the preferred newspaper by Kenyan Africans, was sold on the streets of a newly independent Kenya with this headline. Its first paragraph making it clear just who the heroes of the day were at the time. Field Marshal by Mungi Sasa ni maiti. General Chui ni maiti pia. Gaidi mwingine asiye na cheo M Kyugu amewawa pia. Vifo hivi vitatu vya viongozi wa wale waliokataa kufuata amri ya baba wa taifa Rais Jomo Kenyatta ya kutoka msituni kabla ya Januari 12 vilitokea jana baada ya jeshi la polisi kuingia msituni huko Meru na kushambulia magaidi hawa na kuwaua. Just three months before the killing of these quote-unquote terrorists, the fireworks that had lit up the country's night sky as midnight struck on the 12th of December was still a conversation piece for those who were there to see them. This enigmatic figure was no longer a man to be spoken of in whispers. The legend of a man, Jomo Kenyatta, was now firmly in control of the country. And Field Marshal by Mungi Marete, Dedan Kimathi's chosen leader of the Mau Mau Front in Meru, was still among those who today are called national heroes, freedom fighters. In three short months though, Baimungi's status would transform from brother-in-arms to power-hungry rebel, a dangerous man not to be trusted, a causeless rebel who was to be gunned down. But what if the story of the vanquished Mau Mau Field Marshal by Mungi wasn't that of a rebel who was crushed by the long arm of the law, but a story of murder? The slaying of a man who succeeded Dedan Kimathi as one of the highest ranking Mau Mau fighters in the country, a knife in the back of the emancipation movement, and Kenya's first post-independence assassination. What if, in Field Marshal by Mungi Mareta's brutal end, is a story of one of Kenya's most controversial assets, its land. One hundred and eighteen years ago, in 1895, the people living in the land that would become known as Kenya awoke to a new reality that their land had become a British protectorate. Many of them didn't even know what that meant, but they would soon enough, because that reality would soon be followed by the boots and the bullets of soldiers that would come to enforce the will of the United Kingdom on Kenyans. Laws were signed that stole the land from underneath them, and Kenyans became tenants at will on land that their forefathers had roamed as their own. But the will of the people would not be denied and they were forced into a struggle that culminated in a joyous ceremony on the 12th of December 1963 when the Union Jack came down and Kenya rose as a newly independent African state. But the joy that was felt on that day and days to follow would soon be replaced by bewilderment because the land that people had fought for would be retained by a new class of leaders, Kenyan leaders who used the same laws that colonialists had to retain this very precious resource.
Ibanje ni mudoni aba imungi no mbetawa na dina dina ndite mbuga uti mutongoria wondo tutiji ndite dina nyinge muno onde takiri uria ankana Evangeline Movoni Baimungi was 37 years old when her husband was killed. A rare photograph of the young bride shows a strong, stoic-looking woman. She was at a government gathering where she had asked to be shown where Baimungi had been buried. Fifty years later, her piercing stare has yet to set itself upon her husband's grave. <laughs> Nara di kilo ni mbonu. Nuntu nta amenya ikirwo. She was particularly bitter. To her, the betrayal of a man who was among the first soldiers to commit themselves to the cause of the Mau Mau was more obvious than the mountain that silently watched this twist in his story unfold. Mau Mau Field Marshal Baimungi Marete was born 89 years ago in Muerero village in what is now Meru County. Kirenyaga the mountain from which Kenya would get its name silently witnessed as a young, towering man from the Meru community, known in the region for their large frames and fierce personalities, would be conscripted into the King's African Rifles to fight in a war that his community played no part in starting, in a land further away than he could possibly have imagined. They were taking them away, the, the young men from, you know, who are bright, they didn't want them in Kenya, so they conscripted in them into King's African Rifles and then shipped them away. So, um, and you, you notice that there wasn't any senior officer from that communi those communities uh, at the time of independence. Baimungi would become part of the King's African Rifles and was stationed in Burma during the Second World War. The King's African Rifles were a multi-battalion deployment consisting of African soldiers from all over East Africa. They were part of the 11th African Division that fought against the Japanese in Burma. He would be trained as a mechanic but would also learn how to make guns. The war was devastating. Millions of people from all over the Imperial British Empire died. But the honor of a marked grave was reserved predominantly for the British soldiers killed in the war. Back in Kenya, the Kenyan African Union was at its infancy, but was agitating for the equality of the African in Kenya. No more carrying the pass, no color bar, and representation in the Legislative Council of the colonial government were what they were fighting for. Equal land rights at the time was important on the Kau agenda, but one that they would take the long-term view in gaining. What the, the British did, of course, when they came is to enact various laws to facilitate their grabbing of our land, if I may put it that way. And the earliest piece of registration was the Crown Lands Ordinance of 1902. Cow didn't want to provoke the situation at all. We thought by the normal democratic methods we will get um, our way. In other words, what we were asking for in this was just really human justice. We asked for more representation in Parliament. We asked for more money on education, agriculture, and so on. So for some time, there was a feeling in Cow to continue that sort of struggle. When you consider that the people here in Kenya, the masses of the Africans here in Kenya, are probably roughly about the same stage as Great Britain was 500 years ago, uh, we do not think that normal forms of democracy are suitable. By the mid-40s, 7.5 million hectares of Kenya's best land belonged to white settlers. When Baimungi and other Kenyans sent to fight in Burma returned to Kenya, theirs was a considerably changed world view. The land that the African soldiers had left in the hands of their colonial masters still belonged to these colonialists. They swore that this wouldn't hold for long. <laughs> 
But when these young people came back, first, the army had given them education, but more importantly, they had seen white people fearing and crying and shedding tears. Some of them were braver in the Second World War than their white counterparts. So the myth about the white man had been demystified. And when they came back, they, 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 they were impatient. Wakati nilikuwa katika jeshi ya wabeberu, niligundua mbeberu silafiki yangu. Nilikuwa katika jeshi ya wabeberu? Nilikuwa kwa jeshi ya 1939, mbaka 45. Na wakaenda? Basi kwa, 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 kwa jeshi, nikagundua haza kabisa huyu mbeberu silafiki yangu, ananifanya mtumwa na nchini yangu. Mwangi Kairichi also fought in the 11th African Division that went to Burma. His eyes saw a lot of bloodshed then, mostly, he says, of white men. But he also saw an ill treatment and arrogance towards Africans by rank and file British soldiers that he couldn't stomach. He was among hundreds of young men in the Rift Valley who were waking up to the reality that the colonialist wasn't prepared to leave Kenya just yet. Mwangi's age mate, John Joroge, vividly remembers what his parents told him about his colonizers. Wanatufanya kama watu hawana hakili. Na sisi tunajini, tunataka mumarisike ama muwafike. Kwa hivi sisi wakijana yote tukatoka manyumbani. Unatoka na nini? Na mkuki, na kishu ya njora. By 1951, the simmering malcontent of Africans wailed in the wind at the settlers. Settlers who began to notice the significance of what had now become a critical mass of men and women who couldn't stand colonialism anymore. They began arming themselves and telling the colonial government that if it didn't protect them from the rising native descent, then they would do it themselves. There was far too much carrying of guns, slapping pistols on the bars. At the time, we called them the Kenya Cowboys, and of course they loathed that, but that is exactly what they were. This coincided with the arrival of Sir Evelyn Baring to Kenya to take up governorship of what was now East Africa's most commercially viable colony. He was a man who would prove pliable to the interests of the settlers who wanted the rising unrest to be put down hard. That is exactly what would happen. Shortly after Baring's visit to the restive central region, senior chief Warohio, a colonial stalwart, was murdered. This would be the trigger that would set off a brutal eight-year campaign against the men and women now branded as a Mau Mau. Kenya indeed had been hived off as the jewel in the colonialist Eastern African colonial crown, but in particular, the highlands stretching from Transoia down to Kiambu, called the White Highlands, were of particular interest to settlers. The Kalenjin, who truly were amongst the first African communities in Kenya to resist colonialism, had long since been crushed and forced onto the less fertile native reserves created by consecutive laws that robbed Africans of their land. The Talai's spiritual leader at the time, Koitale al Arab Samoe's progeny, was a shadow of its former self. The Maasai community, who had long roamed Kenya's lands from Nairobi to Eldoret, had also been killed off. First by an outbreak of rinderpest, which finished off the huge herds, then in successive punitive expeditions organized by the British since 1895. Expeditions were the colonialists' politically correct term for state-sanctioned genocide against resistant African communities. The Maasai first went to court in 1903 to argue for the return of their land rights, but that would prove to be an exercise in futility. The Kikuyu, Embu and Meru communities, whose lands were predominantly in central and eastern Kenya, would also be evicted from their lands. But Kikuyu descent would begin in earnest in Kiambu and Nairobi with the formation of the East African Association led by arguably Kenya's first trade unionist, Harry Thuku. It would agitate for better welfare for factory and farm workers 
but would spur the colonial government into implementing hut taxes and a much hated Kipanda system where all Kikuyu, Embu and Meru men above the age of 17 would have to wear a pass in order to move from one place to another, effectively rendering the burgeoning African business community disabled and planting the seed for violent dissent. Johnston Kamau Wangengi, a water meter reader working in Nairobi, would become part of Kenya's history about a decade after Harry Thuku's efforts were scuppered. He would sail to the United Kingdom in 1929, funded by local contributions, to make Kenyan African representations to the United Kingdom on land alienation. These elders, Jesse, Kamau, uh, and, and others, who really were the core group that made the decision to fight for the return of their lands, went uh, to Johnson Kamau, and they told him, we want to send you to Britain to take this petition, which they had written. He agreed. His first trip was unsuccessful, but Kamau Wangengi would return to the UK in 1931, staying there until 1946. This time away would help create a mystique around the man who was fighting for African rights in Britain, as well as a change of name, dropping the name Johnston, becoming Jomo, the Kikuyu word for spear. When Jomo Kenyatta returned to Kenya, he found an intransigent colonial government, settlers digging in for the long haul, and a political movement about to be driven underground. Baimungi Marete found this unrest bubbling in the blood of his community when he got back from Burma. <laughs> wakati huo baimungi kujulikana akatoroka akaenda msitudi kupigania huko akaenda msitudi Wilson Kirimi would be conceived shortly after Baimungi's return from Burma but would rarely see his father when he was an infant but Kirimi knows by heart why he was robbed of a father at such a tender age and all over central Kenya things were happening that would coalesce to bring the Mau Mau to the fore of Kenya's history David Wanyoike Mondo salutes in honor of what is almost spiritual ground for the Mau Mau in Nyeri. 64 years ago, hundreds of men gathered here, outside Roringo Stadium, to hear Jomo Kenyatta speak to them. This commemorative plaque immortalizes that day. Kimondo would jostle for space amongst a charged crowd of men and women. Men like Captain Kimani, who would later become a fierce Mau Mau fighter, as well as other men who stood behind him. Kimondo was barely in his teens, but he wouldn't miss the opportunity to see Kenyatta in the flesh. Katuambia, amekuja kutujulisha sisi tuko chini ya ukoron, tuko kwa mevugo na ukoron, tunaweko minyororo. Kwa hivyo, tujitadishe, tumufukuse, tumuondoe, atuashe, sisi tuko huru, atutoe kwa hiyo minyororo. Yeye 
atashika puda mdomo na wakati atashika mdomo sisi tutashika miguu ya nyuma akauliza kama hizi tunaweza kuvumilia hiyo mateke ya punda tukamwambia tutaweza the clarion call had sounded shortly afterward Jomo Kenyatta was arrested along 180 political leaders from across the region in an operation named Jock Scott. Troops are in the streets of Nairobi. Sir Evelyn Baring, the governor, salutes the men of the Lancashire Fusiliers who have flown in to help clear his colony of the Mau Mau menace, which has struck fear into Kenya's very heart. Later, Operation Anvil in which British colonial forces began screening Kikuyu, Embu and Meru men and women in Nairobi and busing them back to their respective homes began. The drums of war were beating. The men Kenyatta had met and hundreds of others to whom his message would be retold went into the forests. From the Abadares to Molo Forest and all over Central and Eastern, the Mau Mau began their campaign. This uh, Mau Mau is a lawless and savage uh, organization. And uh, I must, at all costs, uh, see that uh, respect for law and order uh, is obtained. tunapigana na wasungu na wengine tulikuwa walikuwa wanaitwa home guard bas na tuanga ingine na tuanga ingine tuliendeshana na mzungu pita ile tulipigana kabisa ni miaka ngapi bila kunya bila kufanya nini hata kufanya nini hata ukura hakuna miaka ngapi mwaka ile sasa ikakuja kama inapoa poa kidogo kidogo wakati hiyo ndio ilikuwa mandege ingine tunaitaka nyagekonyo anajua tu ametaka ilikuwa namwagia sisi bomu ile msitu 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 kwa wakati ya msitu kwa hivyo pita ya mzungu tulipigana naye Hapa ni pahali ilikuwa daki ya maumau. Na tulikuwa tunaamini hapa hakuna wazungu wataweza kutupata. Tulikuwa tunakaa na hata kariba jeno kariba mwenyewe alikuwa na shikio hapa. Hii grunga yani ndio ilikuwa eh, strong room yake ya kukaa. Na askari wengine wanakaa pande hii, wengine ngambo ile, wengine wanawekwa mpaka kwa barabara. Kuna pahali uliona kuna mtaro hivi watu walikuwa wanakaa huko ikiwa ni daki ndio wale watakuja kupeleleza ndio waingie wanamalizio hapo kwa maana ukipiga bingan unarudi unajipisha huko chini na kulikuwa na mwangaza hata watu walikuwa wanapiga hapa hata unaona mash... hata sasa kuna watu wanakuja hapa kufanya kama kutembelea kwa maana wale walikuwa msuni hakuwa na chakula hakuna kitu wageza kutumia huko wakiwa goju hakuna madawa hakuna kitu inayosaidia hawa sisi watu wale tulikuwa kiazi watoto kiazi ndio tulikuwa tunatumwa kwa maana hawa wazugu wangevikiria kama mtoto anaweza kujua kitu tunaenda tunapeleka hiyo madawa tunaagiza hawa bahari watakuja kuchukua chakula tunaagiza hawa bahari watakuja kuchukua silaha ambayo inaweza patikana The Mau Mau were fierce holding out for four years against the might of the British army and the King's African Rifles or home guards as they were called Their cause though quite ironically became mostly inward looking 
with a brutal campaign against those who refused to take Mau Mau oaths or worked for the colonial government, often dying at the hands of the Mau Mau. A handful of settlers and British soldiers died, but the cost to Africans was great. Eventually, a brutal campaign of force and propaganda slowly suffocated the fire of the Mau Mau movement. Kenya is the battlefield of a conflict that cannot end until the Mau Mau is dissolved forever. Cut off from supplies of food and weaponry, the Mau Mau would starve in these caves. Many would fall ill and die in the caves that were their refuge. The colonial government was winning. Perhaps the most infamous image from that time was a parading of a frail field marshal dead and Kimathi by the English press. But it wasn't just his picture that the colonial government would use to demoralize collaborators of the Mau Mau. Pictures like these of fighters killed by the army were often in the papers and in leaflets strewn far and wide. Baimungi, now among the top leadership of the Mau Mau, was still at large. Little is known about where he was exactly, but accounts of where the Meru wing of the Mau Mau was concentrated would place him in the central Meru region. He would likely have needed to subsist on local communities that were known to him. But to stay free, he and his battalion would also have to keep moving, lest they meet the fate that befell many of their brothers in arms. Kwa baki mzuri ya mungu, kweli, hatu kukwicha sisi wote. Tulipakia, na wale wale isha, wale kwisha. Kwa jokwa nyomba yetu ya angu ya mama yangu, si tulipakia wote. Henry Bushman Kibuchi fought in the Mau Mau battalion based in Kirenyaga. He says he would look to the mountain for inspiration. His gaze is now unsteady because of how much he shakes. It's not because of old age, he says. See, to record that we are working home, God. The British army had its foot on the throat of the Mau Mau at this time. Mass arrest campaigns had been initiated, concentrated in central and eastern Kenya. This would mark the beginning of a period that will live in infamy in the minds of any Mau Mau fighter who was caught by the colonialists. Part of their incarceration would include them running a gauntlet of brutal torture meant for them to renounce their oaths, described in the most innocuous of words, the pipeline. Some behind wire are fanatics, men who have taken degrading and beastly oaths, which put them beyond the pale of human society. Others, only tainted with subversive doctrines, are being shown the error of their ways and are slowly being rehabilitated. In fact, I blame myself 
that I haven't got the records somewhere. Somewhere. The towering frame of one-time Kenyatta-era cabinet minister and Mau Mau sympathizer Waruru Kanja moves much slower than it used to. It was a long time ago, the war. The fog of old age has made his recollection of day-to-day -day events difficult at times. Uh, what, you know, what, oh, my goodness, I, I'm trying to, to, to try and get the, the right correct, word. Uh, correct word. But he too remembers the quote-unquote rehabilitation that the British spoke of. They had worked out the methodology of wiping out people. The people died, many people died, as a result of the violence administered. Testicles were screwed off, people were punched silly, they were given cold water treatment. They were given electric shock treatment. Otakanyuereire doe karerita. Yes. If I tell you the suffering we had at Embakas when we were doing the first uh, yeah. airport, eh? until you find, uh, until you find. Um, the black stone. He can go on your honor and then he Nairobi. He moved your Jenga, Embakas airport. Yeah, I moved your Jenga. Yeah. The pipeline was the British government's way of making the Mau Mau law abiding members of society. Men would be periodically tortured by home guards under the instruction of colonial officers and forced to renounce the oaths they had taken. But even in the midst of the chaos of the emergency, or perhaps because of it, the recognition that African land rights would have to be respected began to percolate. The Swinerton plan, one meant for land consolidation, especially in African areas, would open the door to laws that allowed African ownership of land. Progressive as this may have sounded, the letter of the law created an opportunity for an emerging African elite to consolidate their wealth. Most of the people, particularly in Central Province, were still in, uh, languishing in detention. Uh, the, 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 so you can probably say that it was like a conspiracy. Let's give away or, or deal with their land while they are there in, in, in prison. And when they come, they will be faced with a, a fate accomplished. It has been done. You can't change it. The stage was set for a betrayal of the masses of people who fought under the Mau Mau banner and the thousands more who were jailed or dispossessed during the emergency. Kibuchi and thousands of men and women from the Mount Kenya region would move to the Rift Valley and squat there, hoping that their claims to land would be recognized. Because even they knew that it wouldn't be long before freedom came, especially when Joma Kenyatta was released from detention. When do you want independence for Kenya? Today. It was now apparent that colonialism would end. The Conservative Party in Britain, considered the party of the empire, had just been re-elected and Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was acutely aware that the empire was in decline, stating that colonialism could no longer persist in Africa in his famous Winds of Change speech. That was the spirit that met the men who went to the Lancaster House talks. Freedom would soon be upon them, but land still was a stumbling block. Eventually, an agreement was struck that the land question would be dealt with on three levels. The government would set up a committee of resettlement fund trustees who would oversee the disbursement of a fund underwritten by the British for the purchase of land by smallholder and large-scale African landowners in what was called the Million Acre Scheme. <laughs> 
Settlers who wanted to stay in Kenya would have their land protected by law and those who wanted to sell and leave would do so in the now infamous willing buyer, willing seller arrangement. This would appease Britain as well as many settlers in Kenya who were furious at the pace at which the colonial legacy was unraveling. But still, the march towards freedom was on course. The Kenyan African National Union, KANU, was born out of KAU, the political movement banned before the emergency. African representation in the colonial government expanded. Prime Minister, the Honorable Jemma Kenyatta. Soon, self-rule was attained. Rule! And the official date of independence was set. One last thing was left for the Kenyatta government to do. Ensure a voluntary disarmament of the Mau Mau. All across the newly independent Kenya, the call to disarm was being heeded by the Mau Mau. And in what was the mastery of a political moment, Kenyatta would call Mau Mau fighters to lay down their arms at the same place where, 11 years earlier, he gave his hold the donkey's legs speech, Roringo Stadium. <laughs> This is Roringo Stadium, one of the oldest ones in Kenya. But Roringo was also a stage 50 years ago to a continuing drama in the newly independent Kenya. And here's why. The bonds of colonialism had just fallen away. Jomo Kenyatta was able to muzzle the donkey that he had spoken about on the outer edges of Roringo. And the Mau Mau, albeit with a lot of pain, suffering and death, were able to endure that donkey's kicks. So now they came to Roringo not just to hand over their weapons, but to hear what lay in store for them. After all, they were the country's freedom fighters. But what they heard was altogether different from what they had expected. Jomo Kenyatta said to them in Kiswahili, hakuna chabure, meaning that there's nothing for free. So they would have to pay for the land that they had just fought for. Some agreed to do so. But others, like General Baimunge, disagreed. In fact, they were downright furious. A leader has to balance and I, I think it was a good thing that he sought to unify people not to divide them between loyalists and the terrorists but it is not balancing he did he completely forgot and marginalized the nationalists the Maumaus, and chose to work only with the loyalists and the sons of the chiefs and using power these people were completely oppressed 
no recognition of any kind. But worse still, he should have devised, his government should have devised economic social policies aimed at giving an opportunity to the majority. But the policies that continued were those inherited from the colonialists. Baimungi and his battalion would refuse to hand over their weapons and went back to Meru. Most accounts of his reasons for rejecting Kenyatta's call to lay down arms have it that land was the central issue. But there are claims that he wanted more than land. He was wrong in thinking that he should have been the commander of the Kenya army and he was illiterate. Mungi didn't want anything like that. But Mungi simply challenged Kenyatta's idea, Kenyatta's interpretation of the land question and insisted that the, the minimum those people should get is be allocated land that was fertile, that was economically viable at no cost. Yes. This photograph of Baimungi was taken at Kinoru Stadium in Meru the day after Baimungi had stormed out of the Rorengo meeting. With Baimungi are other Mau Mau fighters from the region and the man who would become Kenyatta's point man in Meru, Kenyatta's lands and settlement minister, Jackson Angaine. Angaine had been dispatched by Kenyatta to negotiate the surrender of arms of Baimungi and his battalion. The picture seems to say that Angaine was successful, but Baimungi's family says that the field marshal was actually there to dissuade other Mau Mau fighters from disarming. Baimungi's return to the forest may have had the moral support of many Mau Mau, but few outside his battalion joined him. The next three months were busy ones for Jomo Kenyatta's trusted minister, confidant and brother-in-law, Mbio Koinange. After the rejection of Angaina's overtures, Baimungi insisted that Koinange was the only one he could trust. The shuttle diplomacy between Meru and Gatondo paid off in a meeting between Baimungi and Kenyatta at Gatondo. A photograph taken after the meeting seems to have suggested that the deal was cemented. According to his family, Baimungi and his fellow Mau Mau leaders had agreed that they would leave the forest and lay down arms, even returning with gifts from Kenyatta. But by January 1964, Baimungi was still in the forest. The accounts of why he and a number of Mau Mau generals remained differ. He had uh, his whole, the commanders of his battalion, 
He was actually telling them we've agreed with Jomo, we must now leave. Jomo Kenyatta had run out of patience. On January the 12th, 1964, he ordered that any Mau Mau fighters who had yet to lay down their arms should leave the forest, failure to which they would be forcibly removed. Baimungi stayed put. A tense lull would envelope Meru as a standoff ensued. What Baimungi did not know was that the quiet merely gave the government time to organize an expedition of administration police to smoke him out. Usikuwa manane, kama saa kumina moja, ndiyo walitoka hapo, wakaena, wakabahamia kambi ya Baimungi hapo, karibu na musitu. Baimungi hako urawa, hako lukelele ya, hako lukele dangari, kuma muitone, hako lukelele ya iki imba kuite. Oh, okay. Ia kuite. Na mweko luda ibo ba adena we, mweko luda. And he was persuading his uh, battalions to come out of the forest. So he was murdered in cold blood with his wife watching in the forest. He was not fighting. They were hunted down and some of them even died in the process. Uh, very, very, very uh, unfortunate way of dealing with people who spent years in, the, in those forests fighting for this land. I, I, I would have thought it should have been possible to, to talk to those people. The killing of Field Marshal Baimungi would be amongst the first signs that Kenyatta would not brook any dissent. The conversation around land became one only mentioned in whispers, causing only ripples, but never upsetting the political order. The Million Acre scheme kicked off with Kenyatta leading the charge in giving out titles. According to the law, the president now held all public land in trust for the Kenyans who had entrusted him with leadership. I don't know whether you read, uh, you read uh, Duncan Degwa's book, in, in Kenyatta's Struggles, I think that's the title. Uh, he, there's a small story he gives in the book about this day in 1960 three or 64, I can't remember, when the, the president spent the whole day in, uh, uh, I think, uh, South Kinagop, giving out the, 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 these pieces of settlement uh, plots to the people. And uh, because it was important, obviously, for him to appear to be giving uh, these people and and they spent the whole day there. I mean, uh, most government senior government officials were there and so on and so on. And you know, towards the end of the exercise, <laughs> towards the end of the day, they came across across one of these Z plots you <laughs> you talked about earlier. And uh, the old man says, uh, you know, for my sweat all day here, yeah, I, I I really should have that piece of piece of land and. Of course, that was it. So it was his. Uh, so you can see that, you know, corruption and, uh, you know, irregular methods of doing it start right there. Because even later, as the, most of these plots were allocated through the, the provincial administration and so on, why would the PC or the DC not do the same if I mean if if it was done the other day by the big man why not why not
anaweka zaidi ya 1500 sita hivi hata 10 hmm? na ana shamba hizo yaika zaidi ya 1500 sita 10 hivi ile pesa aliyonunua shamba nazo kwa msungu fulani alikuwa anaweka begi gani hakukukua For the 40 years of Kenyatta's and then former president Moi's rule, there was no substantive attempt to address the question of the abuse of the trust that the public had put in its leadership on matters of land. Land became the springboard for almost all corruption. But also the source of some of the country's bloodiest disputes. Stories of the Mau Mau would become anecdotes of history fable like heroes from a time long gone by the foundation upon which the freedoms that the country enjoys was built when in truth they and what they had stood for was progressively ignored by successive regimes nitaifadhi nitailinda na kuitetea katiba ya Kenya kwa mujibu wa sheria iliyowekwa ewe mwenyezi Mungu nisaidie But when Mwai Kibaki ascended to power in 2003, things seemed like they were bound to change. President Kibaki also set about setting up the commission to look into the illegal or irregular allocation of land in Kenya. What a lot of the ruling elite were not prepared for was that this commission would actually do its job. Names of the high and mighty, including those of family members of Kenya's first two presidents, opposition leaders civil servants and millionaires were named as having procured land in Kenya illegally field marshal by mungi's story is still being written in 2006 former member of parliament gitobo imanyara took president jomo kenyatta's son the then leader of the party that his father led and the leader of the opposition to visit mudoni by mungi in what imanyara thought would be the start of a progress of redress Evangeline Mothoni Marete now lives on a small piece of land bought by her children. She still clings to many memories of her husband, the man she knows to be a hero slain by his brothers. And she is still unbowed by the passing of time in the hope that she will see justice done to one of the Mau Mau's most controversial figures that was never written about. In her books, by Mungi Marete remains the first son of the soil murdered by his kin in a nation that had barely taken its first steps. understand the pain and grievance felt by those who were involved in the events of the emergency in Kenya the british government recognizes that kenyans were subject to torture and other forms of ill treatment at the hands of the colonial administration the british government sincerely regrets that these abuses took place and that they marred kenya's progress towards independence <laughs>